Hey guys, this week I want to dispel a great misconception that not only surrounds a particular verse of scripture, but it cuts to the heart of our American transactional version of the gospel, which says your acceptance of God buys his acceptance of you. Your love for God buys his love for you, or your faith in God buys his faithfulness towards you. And so this really cuts to the heart of our self-salvation model, which says that until we believe or receive or whatever, only then does God love, accept, or receive us into himself. So somehow it's up to man to somehow drum up his own salvation by mustering up and generating faith or whatever. The verse in question in this week's teaching is this, and how many souls have been fearful of this when it's Matthew 10.33, which reads, But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my Father in heaven. The word deny is arneomai, which means actually to contradict. If you contradict him as being your true origin, identity, and innocence, he will contradict you. Francois de Toy says it's because he is fully convinced of your innocence. If you want to deny the truth, he's going to repudiate it, my friend. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. 2 Timothy 2.13. And I also love how Francois' mirror translation uh, covers that one as well. He says, our unbelief does not change what God believes. He cannot contradict himself. Comes from Romans 3, 3 and 4. What we believe about God does not define him. God's faith defines us. God cannot be untrue to himself. And you know, there's also this connotation of shame expressed in Scripture along these same lines of, you know, deny me, I'll deny you. And then we read Luke 9, 26, which reads, If any man is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and of the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Now, understand that to reveal grace in these hard sayings is not to diminish their sternness. Jesus is intentionally stern for our sake, but he is not a narcissistic monster here. He's not saying, earn your acceptance before God uh, by touting his, his name everywhere and, and, and not being ashamed of him. He's, he's saying, accept your already given gift of acceptance because it's a shameful and disgraceful existence to deny reality, to reject Mr. Happy. Now, this verse is couched in the whole deny yourself and take up your cross passage here in Luke. And Jesus isn't saying kill off your old nature. That would invalidate every one of Paul's letters in which we're told our old nature died with Jesus on his cross. But yes, Jesus says, if you follow me, it's going to piss people off and they'll want to kill you. Be ready for that. That's what a cross is all about, killing somebody. But don't get depressed. I mean, cheer up, champ. He says in another passage, I've overcome the world. But as for this whole denial of self thing, yes, the separate sinful self is dead. So don't be a dork and keep sinning. The real denial of self is a repudiation, a disowning, a contradicting of self. That's what the Greek literally means. We disown any association with that old sinful self. You have been crucified with Christ. Done deal. You're not fighting the old man. You're you're repudiating any existence whatsoever that it even has over your own life. To live any other way or to spend another day bound up by it is to live according to the big lie that it even has a hold over you whatsoever. The Greek word ashamed here is uh, epai skunomai, however you pronounce it. I'll be honest with you, I'm a little rusty on my Greek. 
but it properly means disgrace. The Strong's says it's like someone singled out because they misplaced their confidence or support. Believed the big lie, Strong says. To be ashamed of the Lord is to own a lie and to choose a lesser lover, a deaf, dumb idol over living, breathing essence of beauty himself. But get this, this verse doesn't necessarily indicate that Jesus will just be ashamed of that individual person. The pronoun here can just as easily say, if anyone is ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of this before the Father. Not the person himself. He's ashamed of shame itself. He hates that old sinful nature. He rejects that false self before the Father. That's the glory of the gospel. It's the whole hate the sin, love the sinner thing on the one hand, but it's more than that. Jesus not only presents you spotless before the Father, including purging your every act of treason and denial, but he even bears your shame before the Father and cleanses your consciousness. Therefore, we read in Hebrews 2.11, both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. The shame is removed, not because of your loyalty or your faithfulness, but because he has made you holy. Well, does that mean that we should just deny Jesus every day? We can just get away with it? No, get your head out of your keister. When your shame is removed, you're not going to run away from him. You're going to boldly approach the throne of grace. But be careful when you start relying on your own faithfulness to give you access to the Father. Look, here's a passage I'll read from the great theologian Thomas F. Torrance. It's on what true evangelism really is. It's not telling people they've got to generate enough faith or loyalty or whatever to merit entrance into the Father's presence, but it's this. This is what he writes. He says, God loves you so utterly and completely that he has given himself for you in Jesus Christ, his beloved Son, and has thereby pledged his very being as God for your salvation. In Jesus Christ, God has actualized his unconditional love for you in your human nature in such a once and for all way that he cannot go back upon it without undoing the incarnation and the cross and thereby denying himself. Jesus Christ died for you precisely because you're sinful and unworthy of him and has thereby already made you his own before and apart from you ever believing in him. He has bound you to himself by his love in a way that he will never let you go. For even if you refuse him and damn yourself in hell, his love will never cease. Therefore, repent and believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. From beginning to end, what Jesus Christ has done for you, he has done not only as God, but as man. He acted in your place in the whole range of your human life and activity, including your personal decisions and your responses to God's love, and even your acts of faith. He has believed for you, fulfilled your human response to God, even made your personal decision for you so that he acknowledges you before God as one who has already responded to God in him, who has already believed in God through him, and whose personal decision is already implicated in Christ's self-offering to the Father, in all of which he has been fully and completely accepted by the Father, so that in Jesus Christ you are already accepted by him. Therefore, renounce yourself and follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, I know this makes people angry because the gospel makes people angry. You're thinking, well, this is too easy. His faith is enough to save me. Does this undercut our own personal faith response to the message? By no means. His faith is the very thing that empowers my faith. The reality of my inclusion in the life of God before I ever asked, before I ever voted on the matter, it haunts me, chases me down, and compels me to make a choice. Not a choice of whether I'll die and be raised. That's already happened in Christ. It compels me to decide whether I will thankfully, joyously embrace the divine life he's given me and recognize 
recognize that I have been crucified with Christ. Whatever our faith response may be, it is merely an expression of and confidence in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. His repentance on behalf of man is the only thing that empowers true change of mind and action within man. Placing salvation fully in his court means that self is taken out of the equation altogether, and that is the only place where true trust happens. No longer trusting in our own efforts, our own religious appeals, our own decision, anything whatsoever to do with a human anthropological me, me, me focus. It is all Christological. It is all focused on him. His conclusion about you is the substance and source of salvation. He says you are perfect. You are holy. My act of salvation is completely sufficient for you altogether. My ecstatic yes response to hearing that truth of my union with him, of my perfection in him, it only finds its validity. My response of faith only finds its validity in that union itself. So to preach human response invalidates the gospel. It's putting a price tag on the gospel. Our faith is personalized only insofar as we hear and recognize his already completed work. That's the object. That's the substance of what we're believing. It's not belief itself. <laughs> it's the substance, which is the incarnation, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It's an amen to what he already knows to be true about me, thanks to what he did. It is an amen to his always and unconditional love of me. My faith must never be the condition of salvation. My faith can only be full, true, and effective so long as it is a response to the prior saving work of Christ and his faith. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Romans 3.3. 3. No way, boys and girls. He will never forsake or abandon you. Even if we are faithless, he will remain faithful. Bless you guys. And check out these amazing events coming your way. Coming to the Redneck Riviera next month. That's right, Florida. Our only mystical school in the Dirty South will be in Jacksonville, Florida, May 15th through 17th. It's my first school there in the past seven years, so come have a spring break with us. Also, next month, I'm in Chicago. The Windy City has more than just gangsters, politicians, and amazing baseball. So come join us May 29th through the 31st. And my first ever school in Michigan is in Grand Rapids, June 26th through 28th. Then I'm in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, July 17th through 19th. And our only mystical school in the Southwest United States is in Phoenix, Arizona, July 31st through August 2nd. It's going to be hammered drunk. Then I'm in Louisville, Kentucky, October 9th through 11th. And all our friends in Europe who want a Mediterranean retreat should join us in Gibraltar, south of Spain, September 25th through 27th. Find all our schools at thenewmystics.com slash schools. And besides the mystical schools, we also get a little crazy with our special tours this year. I'm coming to my favorite islands for my UK Northern Ireland tour in September. I'll be in Belfast, Edinburgh, Leeds, and London. Early registration for all four cities is at thenewmystics.com slash UK. And another tour is hitting the east coast of North America as I travel with Tim Wright to four cities on our Mega Grace Tour. This October, we're hitting Toronto, Canada, Massachusetts, Maryland, and Alabama. Early bird registration for that one is now available at thenewmystics.com slash tour. And we haven't left out our Australia and New Zealand friends. So guys, keep your eye out for a five city down under tour coming your way at the end of the year. And finally, get your rear end onto the mission field as we travel to Indonesia with a team for an explosive, high-octane, glory adventure to the slums, the leper colonies. We're going to host a massive regional grace gathering. It all happens in November. So find out how you can join us at thenewmystics.com slash indie.